I'm Dr. Diana Bittner with True Women's Health. And I'm Dr. Becky Lynn with Evora Women's Health. And we're here at NAMS and we're very excited to share our learnings. I've made a list. I know Becky's made a list. And so too. we're just going to make this really casual. And I think the first thing that I want to share is um, guidelines on treatments for migraines. And, and um, we know about new meds, but the, the takeaway for me was perimenopause really is a time where there's a second surge of migraines. Yes. And we have to be able to screen and treat. Yep. And I think that's really important because women, especially in those perimenopause and early menopause years, they're like, what's wrong with me? Why do I either have new onset headaches or why are my headaches getting worse? And now we can confidently say it's due to those fluctuations in hormones that cause so many other difficulties. Exactly. Yes, and Dr. Good. Simon mentioned oral progesterone at night can be really yeah. helpful. Yep. Because it helps with the sleep issues, which then can compound headaches. Right, right. So that was a, that was a good point that he made. How even if it's not directly, um, you know, fixing the migraine, it can help sort of downstream when people get better sleep. Right. And just being around these world experts is just so exciting. Yeah. Um, I think one of my big takeaways from NAMS is that it makes me feel really good that we're on the right track back at True. Yes, I definitely agree. That's what I love about coming to these um, to these conferences. NAMS, by the way, is North American Menopause Society um, because you just want to make sure that what you're doing is right and then you can add to the information, like what is the data showing? What what articles have been published since we went to our last NAMS exactly. conference? Exactly. So, oh, two years ago, pre-COVID, right? But also it makes me very motivated to do even better, to keep inventing, to keep improving, not have to reinvent the wheel, but to make the wheel even better. Right, right. And what I love is just to bring the information back to my patients because that's that's my job, that's your job, it's our mission to, to make sure that women have the information that they need to make the best healthy choices that they can. Exactly. And make it about what they care about and what they want about. So, you know, if you're listening to this, again, both of us have this information. You know, we'll have things posted on our website and we'll just continue to share you. So what else? What else is it? Yeah. So there were a couple other things. Um, one of the biggest things that I heard yesterday was that tamoxifen can be protective against COVID, and I was amazed. It was fascinating. That. Yeah. So, Dr. Clayton brought that up, right? From um, the ORWH. I can't remember who yeah. brought it up, but um, but and it works in a different. Way. So tamoxifen is a medicine that's used to block the estrogen receptor, and it's commonly used in women with breast cancer who have who are estrogen receptor positive. Um, but it also has other sort of side effects. It works through a different protein kinase, and that can be protective against COVID. And I was like, you know, breast cancer is, is not a good thing for people to get, and so many women get it. And if you're going to end up on tamoxifen, there might as well be another benefit to being on tamoxifen. Exactly. But but what's interesting is tamoxifen is CERM, so it affects some estrogen receptors in ways, in, in different nuanced ways, depending on how old you are, depending on where you are in the menopause status. But we also know that women on estrogen have a protective effect against COVID. Yes. Yeah. Now, early on in COVID, they were actually looking at giving men estrogen to see right. if it was protective against COVID. A right. study never happened, um, but but there definitely were noticing that postmenopausal women on estrogen had a protective effect against right. serious consequences of COVID. So it's interesting that tamoxifen is a serum, but yet it's protective. So right. there's got to be some nuances with that estrogen receptor. Well, so I think what the point that they made in the talk yesterday was that instead of working through blocking or acting like or uh, binding to the estrogen receptor, that it has this other pathway that it that you know is typically sort of an adverse effect, affecting a kinase, a protein kinase, um, but. That was protective against COVID. So it was sort of tamoxifen in its way that it protects against COVID wasn't the same way oh, that it blocks, that it, that it helps sure. prevent recurrence of breast cancer. Very cool. So different mechanism. Very cool. Yeah. Um, another learning I had was about cervical cancer guidelines. I mean, as a gynecologist, you're a gynecologist, yep. you know, we, we take care of women with emerald pap smears all the time. But what was really interesting to me is that so many women don't qualify to opt out of pap smears at age 65. Mm -hmm. You know, it tends to be a routine expectation now that you don't have to have pap smears after 65, where again, in fact, many women do need pap smears after mm -hmm. 65. So we have to make sure we're looking at those, triaging those guidelines when we make that decision. Absolutely. I think they showed a study that was done that showed some somewhere mm -hmm. upwards of like 30% of women needed pap smears after 65 yeah. that we wouldn't be picking up if we didn't have their history with us, if we didn't have them, their pop smear history over the last 10 years and everything. So that yeah. that definitely stuck with me also because definitely. I don't want to miss any cervical cancers. No, no. Yeah. especially. And, and with women, let's say being 
single or out of maybe a monogamous relationship, maybe they were married or and now they're divorced or they're widowed, you know, is there a role for the HPV vaccine to, so they're not clear guidelines about that, but at least there's not the age restriction anymore right. from the right. FDA. It was interesting. There was um, a question to Dr. Policar about, you know, getting the HPV vaccine in your 50s. Um, and if you're, you know, maybe recently divorced or a new relationship, should you get that? Um, and I think that comes up a lot in my practice. I've definitely seen women in their 50s, new relationships, worried about HPV. And I thought it was interesting that he said that it really, he would not recommend it because the transformation zone in the area that the HPV uh, virus likes has moved up in the endocervical canal as opposed to being. I don't, know, I, I don't know. know. I don't agree I know. with that. And I, I recommend the HPV yeah. vaccine. And to me, that means that the transformation zone is going up even further and harder to detect with a with a pap smear, especially if a woman's choosing not to be on estrogen, and that zone becomes even less accessible. Right. So but I guess I, mean, I would disagree with that. And yeah. I've taken care of women with anal cancer right. caused by HPV. Right that they've probably potentially gotten from a second relationship. Yeah. And so it's really important to be thinking common sense as well. So right, as long as right. it doesn't cause harm, right. and there's and no clear guidelines, risk. and it's very low risk, why not? Right, and I agree with you. I was actually surprised that he said that. Right. Um, but I do, I, I feel, and I also feel like, yes, you have to look at the data, but when it comes to your patient, and you're talking to your patient, the risks are low, Right. the benefits, right. But again, he was on the stage, and they have to be very careful about following data. guidelines yes. with the data, right. which with I so data, recommend. Evidence based. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So another takeaway I wanted to share was just the the American Heart Association statement on menopause and cardiovascular disease risk that we have to, of course, be looking for risk, and how important it is that we stratify risk using the ASCVD, which is a guideline. The Reynolds score I still love is more of a gender specific using the HSCRP. But also, you know, as we look at those guidelines and look at the age of menopause, it can be really important to treat with lifestyle modification, but also um, consider the early use of statins mm -hmm. and also consider hormones as uh, not a treatment to reduce the, reduce the risk of heart disease, but to help women feel better and potentially adopt more healthy lifestyles. But also, you know, uh, Dr. Joel Kling today gave a talk and talked about, you know, a woman with family history of heart disease. And when you talk to a woman with vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats, and you're making that decision with the with your patient, um, whether or not to use hormones, you want to take that into account, her cardiovascular uh, family history and her risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And so, you know, I feel like we spend a lot of time talking about how in the Women's Health Initiative, um, there was a decreased risk of cardiovascular disease and women in 50 to 59 When women age started age, early, right? In that, right. In that window, there's that window of opportunity, right? right. I mean, right. obviously, if you start later, there's an increased risk. Right. Um, but I, and I, I asked this question in the talk, I'm, I feel like at some point with more data, maybe it's going to be something that we can recommend for prevention I as so. opposed to now just including that information in your decision-making right. process. I still look forward to that, but yes, we don't have clear guidelines on that, but the elite trial, you know, shows reduced risk of uh, coronary artery calcification with early use yes. and lower risk of thickness of the carotid artery. So there's just more and more data building, and so I think we're going to learn more in years to come, and that's why we're going to keep coming back to NAMS. Right, yes. right, yes. right. It's the resource. I have one other thing I want to say that I think is really important when it comes to risks associated with hormone therapy. Many, many women are afraid of breast cancer, right? They're worried about their risk of breast cancer when starting hormones. Um, but what we heard today in one of our talks, and I've heard this before, is that it's it's a small increased risk for breast cancer with certain forms of hormones. And the that synthetic is a, progesterone. The synthetic yes. progesterone. Yeah. yeah, she didn't really talk about she that today, did. and I meant yeah. to ask a question about that with so let's just say Prempro, which was what was used in the WHI. And that small increased risk for breast cancer was similar to the increased risk for breast cancer if you're obese or you have a sedentary lifestyle. Or you drink two glasses of wine a day. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's really, it's a small risk, but when you look at that, you should, if you're afraid of that increased risk for breast cancer with hormones, you should be afraid of being obese or not moving, not being active. So that just brings home the point that, you know, there are definitely huge lifestyle changes that we talk about all the time. Exactly. And I know it's easier said than done for women to get out and move when they're busy and their you know, jobs and kids and all that, but it's so important to exercise mm -hmm. and have, um, you know, eat 
eat, eat right. Yeah, and That'd even good 30 minutes a day divided into 10 minute increments. Even right. if we can just walk 10 minutes, you know, three times a day, that, that can definitely make a risk. And really limiting alcohol to fewer than three a week would be ideal, but of course, seven being the hard stop. Right, seven right. is the hard stop. Yeah. No more than seven in a week. Exactly. So we did have a couple glasses of wine this weekend here at NAMS, but you know, it was everything in moderation. But what I'm so excited about is just the energy here. There's so many healthcare providers from all over the world that were here. Um, and uh, again, we are the North American Menopause Society. So there was a contingency from Mexico, from Canada, and so, but, but still people from all over the world. And um, the energy and the excitement, we all want to take care of women. We all want to do a good job. And I'm so excited to be part of this group of providers. I am too. I really am. So thanks for watching and uh, look forward to continuing to bring you good information.